I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... Hi, I'm JL Westover, and I do the comic strip, Mr. Lovenstein. I saw something that one thing that said you were from like Stevens Point. It was like a Comic Con that you went to like I was years ago. Ten pages deep on a Google search document, <laughs> and I found one little snippet. Exactly. Like you grew up in Wisconsin, or you just were like here briefly. That's right. Uh, born and raised Central Wisconsin, the heartland of the heartland. Don't miss it. Moved out of there as soon as I possibly could. <laughs> Yeah, I hate cold weather. I hate snow. And now I reside in the great state of North Carolina. I almost moved to Texas. A couple of my friends were looking into jobs in Houston, programming jobs, Mm -hmm. because I was dabbling in programming at the time. And it was for some like hosting site called HostGator that I actually use now for my site. But (laughs) It looks super sketch back then. It's like all these weird hosting sites have like mm-hmm. cartoon mascots and Yeah. It's like those um, general insurance commercials. Yeah, it's a well, dude with the big mustache <laughs> and it's like, Oh, I totally trust you for my insurance. <laughs> yeah, you got a, a CGI old general man. I, I'm on board, let's do this. It's like <laughs> But uh I I chickened out, didn't go. But then later after I graduated college, I was getting serious with my girlfriend and she's originally from North Carolina. And I was like, all right, I'll go with you to North Carolina and stay there. Got married, settled down here, and no regrets. You, what did you go to college for when you went? Well, this sounds almost like an interview of, like for a job right now. Where do you see yourself <laughs> in five years? Resume. <laughs> oh, well, I... <laughs> when I first... Like, I did not have high expectations for myself getting out of high school. When I started high school, I, I didn't give a hoot. <laughs> and uh by the end of end of high school senior year i actually like started to get my hoots together i was like well i probably could do okay at a technical college and i had no idea what i wanted to do i did do like art at that time but it was just for funsies at that time i was like everyone else and was like you can't do art as a career right. you just can't you're a fool so i went to this tech school called mid-state technical college good name yeah it's in the middle of the state it's technical college (laughs) and uh, i went there for a two-year degree in marketing i thought well maybe i can do something with that that's flexible really i I had no clue i was 18 and i was like ah marketing that sounds good yeah it's a good business sounding word and i had uh actually done door-to-door sales you literally went door-to-door you you yeah, were the in, guy oh my god that sucks in the year of our lord 2008 <laughs> i was doing door-to-door sales wow what were you selling uh, was it even anything people paint. would want paint well it was like an exterior paint jobs for your home or like your anything outside like a shed or fence okay which is like a huge Huge ask for someone. It wasn't like I was trying to sell candy. encyclopedia books. Yeah, a kidney? Did you say Can- kidney? No, candy. Kidney oh, too. That'd I wasn't trying. Please buy my kidney. Yeah. Um, I'd be okay if someone came to my door trying to sell me candy. But it, exterior paint jobs it was awful. I just my only angle was out of pity. I just made people feel bad when I did it in like the middle of winter, and mm-hmm. I purposely wore like light clothing so i was cold oh. so when they opened the door they would take pity on me i did that for a whole week and that's about as hard as it gets i could do marketing so i got to mid-state it was actually great i learned a bunch about like business and marketing and like communication and like actually having to do work like organize myself more just like basic life skills honestly it was It was a good time there, but by the end of it, when I graduated, at the same time I was working at like retail jobs, at the end of my two years there, I was working at Walmart. 
I don't know. I don't know many people who uh, think think fondly back to working at Walmart. <laughs> like, oh, those were the good oh, old days. Oh, if only I could Wish go I back. Could... That's what time machines are for. Go yeah. back to Walmart. Well, when did you Walmart. actually start doing web comics? Like, what made you go? Um, was it just something like, yeah, I'm going to do some web comics, and you just started posting them? Or like, how did you even get into that? It's a weird thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's a really weird thing. So web comics, it's a, it's a strange field, but it felt even at, when I got started doing it, it felt like that was the direction everything was going. Like the industry as a whole was like hulking its way towards online. And obviously there's still a lot of physical media out there, but there's this slow convergence to everything must be digital. You know, I think like everybody else growing up, I read newspaper comic strips. I didn't really read like zines or comic books or like superhero stuff like casual fan you know if <laughs> if i went to go see uh iron man i'd be getting roasted by nerds because i'm just a casual who doesn't actually read comics but newspapers comics i was i love those but as i got older i realized that field is like kind of in lockdown almost permanently i did some research and like the odds of getting onto a syndicate are like lower than like making it onto a professional sports team. Not many other fields are you competing with uh, so many dead people. <laughs> yeah, you know, like <laughs> I'm up against reruns of you know like Family Circus mm-hmm. and the Peanuts and just artists who are long gone, but they keep recycling the strips because they're so popular. I realized, like, sadly, that I wouldn't be able to do comic strips like that as a career so when i was in high school i did it for fun just to make my friends laugh and i was really inspired by web comics at that time so that would have been like the mid 2000s the web comic scene was like just starting to get like a real foothold like hey start to take us seriously like some of us are successful now some of us are making a career of this Mm -hmm. it was hard as hell not many people could do it and you still had to have like one foot in the physical world. Like you're still, you're going to conventions and making books. You knew you made it when some physical media artist like gave you a pat on the back. Like, wow, your online stuff's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. You're like, gee, thanks. So I was reading stuff like the, the number one I was reading because I was on MySpace at the time. Yeah. And this was like, for me, the first exposure I had to social media being like the engine to gain exposure and it was uh explosives uh side night happiness comic strip that was like the one that like wow anything goes online you can swear you can have violence the format you're not limited by size it can be as tall or as wide as you want it can be innocent it could be cruel whatever that was like my first real inspiration when i actually started doing my comic mr lovenstein that was back in 2010 right when I was just about to graduate from the tech school, I distinctly remember it. I was doing, I was in a class. It was some business class. I was doing a doodle on the back of my homework and I made it. I just ended up making a whole comic trip. And I was like, this is all right. (laughs) This is, this is funny, I guess. And Facebook was around by then. Mm. And so I was like, well, I could post this to Facebook and have my friends see it. You know, I got like 10 likes from my friends and like one encouraging comment. I was like, all right, well, I'll just draw more of these, I guess, and keep posting them on Facebook totally as a hobby. And this was on your personal account. You didn't even, this was on my personal account. Because they probably didn't even have the pages yet. Like it took them a while to do that. Okay. Back then it was still like called like fan pages or st- and right. stuff like that. It's, yes. It was not anywhere where it is now. Twitter was just getting going. I, had, I didn't even understand what Twitter was. So yeah, that was just for my friends. And then, so like I mentioned, I was working at Walmart and I just got this marketing degree and I'm thinking, well, this is the world I'd be living in. I <laughs> guess I could, you know, I'd be, get a marketing job. I remember I was just a lowly Salesforce or shit and- I remember working in the back and there was a door in the back that had a little placard on it that said like marketing on it. And I was like, oh, so I guess the marketing guy is sitting there and that's what they do. So I guess I go from being out here to being inside that room. 
That sounds fun. And really, probably one of the most important moments in my life was setting up a display at Walmart for laundry detergent. I <laughs> I'm waiting to see where this goes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I I never set up a display before by myself. It was when like, you worked. I, worked, I was a sales floor guy, and they'd be like, "Hey, go fill that shelf over there. Put fill it up with toilet paper." It's like, yes, sir. And this one time, they put gave me responsibility of like setting up the shelves, deciding where to put what, where to put the detergent, where to put the signs. You know, this is your baby. I was like, all right. And I spent like a whole day doing this and I got it done. You know, I, and I was so proud of myself. You know, I'm taking a step back, admiring this beautiful detergent display. I, I clock out and I come back the next day. It's gone. My display is gone. And they're like, oh, yeah, we didn't really uh, we decided against it. And we we moved it somewhere <laughs> else or something. They're like, this and, is embarrassing. Get this out of yeah, here. Yeah, he did it. <laughs> that was the worst detergent display I've ever seen. Okay. But I just kind of realized that, like, everything I was doing there was impermanent. Mm-hmm. And it was just maintenance for this big faceless corporation. And no matter what I did, like, nobody gave a shit. The customers didn't give a shit. Mm-hmm. The management didn't give a shit. I didn't give a shit. And I was like, well, when I create... Like art, it's it's permanent. If it's good or bad, it's permanent. I can look back on it. Other people can look back on it. If I drop dead today, it's still there. Hmm. <laughs> and I just kind of had this epiphany, like, you know what? Screw all this. I'm going to go back to college now. And this time I'm going to go for art because I'm young and this is my only shot. And so I decided to go to the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, to uh, get a fine art degree and just totally change gears. I was like, either I do this or I just go back to where I am right now. So I just had to give that a shot. Well, this. <laughs> you kind of just did look fondly on Walmart, didn't you realize that? <laughs> like, that uh, kind of fondly helped. Fondly leaving it. Yeah, fondly... but, but still, it's it's a memory that actually created something that changed your life. I mean, wh- same way that like getting in a car wreck makes you realize, like, I need to do things differently. I, you know, it's It was car exactly wreck. like a car wreck. <laughs> You did a Kickstarter for a book, and yep. first of all, your chili pepper like goal reach thing. Oh man, that cracked me up, especially when you <laughs> ate the last one. <laughs> you, yeah, the... you were like you were holding it together, but at the same time, you're like, I, I have to get through it. You were still making jokes, but then there's you, you like got all sweaty, and then you ripped your shirt off, and you're like all splotchy under right. I was a sweaty little boy. Oh, that was super funny. So that was just to create a book, and now it's just like, well, it's real easy to create a book these days. And That was uh, almost five years ago, and I'd argue it was even pretty easy to make a book then okay. versus before Kickstarter and before so- social media became so ubiquitous. Getting a book published with any hopes of it getting sold to anyone was a terrifying prospect. Like, it was a huge investment. Because you had to pay, you had to pay for it up front if you didn't have a publisher. So if you wanted to self-publish, you had to slam down multiple thousands of dollars, like with this hope and faith in yourself that you're gonna come out ahead once you do this, and yeah. not just have all of your furniture made out of your books. For me, when I did it, I mean, I had the luxury of Kickstarter. So if it fails, it fails. I'm not out anything except my time. Mm-hmm. And my digestive tracts ruined from the peppers. But, uh, you know, and then it's like getting pre-orders, That's you know, which is kind of a magical thing. Yeah. We take for granted now. And I had all the social media still at that time, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, all that shit at my disposal. So really, I was lucky to have done it then. And now it's just gotten easier and easier which I couldn't be more happy about for especially online artists just being able to just like if you live in Finland or if you live in Australia or China whatever if you like if you're a fan of my stuff you can support me and buy my book and you know it's like it's become so global now 
that you don't have to build up this grassroots movement in your area, which mm-hmm. is very, very, very hard to do. And <laughs> yeah, I never even attempted it. But how did you build up your audience? I mean, you are, especially even if people, uh, I tell them about you or about your comic, they'll be like, oh, I haven't heard of that. And then I'll show them a picture. And it's like one of those actors that you see in something. It's like, I know him from something. You know, they see the the comic and they're like, oh, yeah, I have seen that. You are actually a very popular comic. So how did that come about? Like, was there something that happened or did it just you just kept doing it and it just kept growing? That is a great analogy. <laughs> I love that now. I, my comic is like that bald dad that's in like 40 different sitcoms <laughs> yeah. and movies. It's just like, yeah, he always has he's. He, that guy always plays the uh, sergeant in the police force. And he's always <laughs> mad. I don't know his name. Yeah, that, that is the funny thing about being online. Like when I do conventions, I get that all the time where it's like they don't know the name of my comic strip, but they'll stop and uh, they'll see one of my comics. They're like, hey, I've, I've seen that. I've seen that before mm-hmm. on, on Instagram. I get that question a lot, especially from like up and coming artists where it's like, well, how do you get where you are? And a lot of it is persistence. I mean, I should, I'll say 80% of it is persistence at first, like just keep making it, keep making it, keep posting it. It can't be any easier now because it's all like, you just post it on Facebook, you post it on Twitter, you post it on Instagram, Reddit, et cetera. I'd say another part of it is growing. If you look at my first comic strip, and that's a kind of the magical thing about online comics is you can just go from my first strip, which I made like 10 years ago, yeah, and compare it with the one I made two days ago. You wouldn't think it was the same guy. Just how crude and just totally different my style was then. And just having this weird relationship that you have online where I, I post stuff and then I get instant feedback, whether I like it or not. That feedback then shapes my next comic. Take the good, ignore the bad. And then I, that cycle just continues and continues and continues. You learn stuff. You learn what works. You learn what doesn't work. Push yourself. Experiment. You look at other artists, see what they're doing. Be inspired by them. But, you know, not like copying them but it's it's that constant output you need to do and i'm so blown away these days by like the current artists the current comic artists like the new ones my early comics sucked I, like they're bad <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple gems here and there but i look back on them and i just cringe mm-hmm. and i really did not get my footing until like four or five years in which is a long time to go if i told someone Hey, you're just starting out, but in four and five years. But if you were like, <laughs> I can't put these out until then, you're not going to have a chance to grow and learn. And like, exactly. I, th- I think putting it out there and seeing it, knowing that it's out there and other people are looking at it, it's different than looking at your book going, oh, I think that's okay. And then it's online and you're like, oh my God, I need to do better than that because people are looking at this. And the internet is is such a cruel mistress. It's the only reason why it can exist, but at the same time, you know, it's complete transparency of... And anybody can say anything. There's anonymity. It's a fun word to say. <laughs> Where the assholes of the world are going to find you. They're not going to hold back. And that's a good, it's a terrible thing because it makes it hard to sleep at night. But it's a great thing because you learn really fast. When you're with your bubble of friends and you're making anything, any kind of art, they're going to soften their blow. They're going to be nice to you. You know, it's like your mom's never going <laughs> to say anything cruel. Right. The internet is going to be 100% honest with you. And then it allows you to be 100% honest with yourself. It's like a, a fighter going off to train somewhere up in the mountains with like yeah. the masters or something. And what happens is the people who don't succeed, either they just ignore the feedback and they just keep pushing forward with what they think is good. You know, God bless them. But, and then there's the other group that just get beat down mm-hmm. and just give up or they get distracted or life happens or they, just, they, they can't handle it. What do you do for, for 
your art? Like, what do you? I did the thing where, you know, everybody goes, I'm going to create one thing a day this year. And then I never held to it. I was, there was an Ivan Brunetti book and I was doing the lessons in it going, okay, I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to have him teach me how I can learn how to do comics. In the past, I've done animations and comics and stuff like that, but never really stuck to it. Like I've even had opportunities to do something and just because of my own laziness, like missed like tons yeah. of opportunities. And then I just never did anything with it. So anyway, I was like, I'm going to kind of hunker down in the first day. And one of the lessons was uh, do four panels of something that happens in your life. Anything, try and find something to tell a story about, about your actual life for seven days. And I decided to tell my wife that. And then we found out that day I told her, she told me she had breast cancer. So I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just sat and drew a comic about that. And it was really cathartic. Blah. Anyway, so I did that. She's better now. She's, you know, it's, it's, the cancer's gone. We're doing better, but I've been That's doing good. the comic since then. And now it's about like my life up until this point. It's like, this has been the most satisfied I've been. So how do I pursue this? And then I started this podcast. So I still do the daily comic and now I do the podcast meeting other artists and like learning from them and like networking and trying to meet people. So that's, that's what I do every day. And I'm trying to get back into the animation again. But basically, yeah. I just do the comic for myself. And I mean, I literally just try to find something every day that I did that I could draw about. So, but that's what I do every day. And it was strange. I mean, like, what have you had moments where you're like, I should just quit this or do something else? No, I've always believed in myself. That's good. I've always, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that, uh, I was going to say that did sound <laughs> like maybe you were doing a thing, but I didn't know because if you do believe in yourself, that's awesome. Oh, I mean, <laughs> show me, like, if there's a one superpower I'd have, it's a believe in himself, man. Yeah, the guy. Is, I mean, court. Of course, I've had all sorts of times where I'm just like laying on my floor, staring at my ceiling, just thinking like, uh, maybe this wasn't it. Maybe mm. this was a bad idea, <laughs> and I just convinced myself that I'm actually good at this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I'm always having doubts or getting stressed out i mean there is nothing more humbling in my field than putting a lot of work into uh, doing a lazy comic in your own in your own mind you think you're being lazy it's a real quickie does great then you do one that's like all right now do let's get let's get down to business let's be for real this one's going to be awesome put a, a ton of work into it think it's a banger you put it out totally bombs mm -hmm. and then i'm like i don't know what's good anymore i don't know what's funny anymore i just why did i spend all that time doing that but i always come back to it it's that's this weird relationship that i built up because of that persistence like when i when i first started doing my comic strip I mean, it was a hobby for four, four years. And my rule for myself was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, okay. you will have a comic strip on your website, no matter what. And that was really important because it got me into this cycle that to the point where it just became a part of my life. No matter what was going on, that thing was happening in the background which is a weird thing to think about. Like I'll, I'll look back at a comic strip from some year where a lot of crazy stuff was going on. Like what you said with like the wife getting breast cancer, that's a huge, crazy thing to happen. It's devastating. And, you know, we all have those life moments, uh, but I was still making this funny comic strip mm -hmm. throughout all of that. And now I don't even think about it. It's like, I am compelled no matter what, even if I probably, if I changed careers and all of a sudden I'm in that marketing room at Walmart, I'd still be doing these comic strips. I'm sure of it. Cause now when I bomb, I'm just like, all right, there's next time. What can I learn from this? Exactly. Even if I bomb two or three times in a row. So it's just become second nature, honestly, at this point. And I love it. It's, it's this awesome challenge that I get to have every day. It's like, all right, I have to come up with something 
that hopefully no one else on on the planet has come up with in all of human history. Here we go. Let's mm. give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. Probably won't, but let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. I keep picturing in my head when you now that you've talked about that marketing door at Walmart, I'm just trying to imagine like what you saw was behind that door in your own mind. <laughs> I keep picturing like, you know, you hear the, oh, you know, and they're like unicorns and stuff just jumping around. <laughs> I think I pictured like three guys sitting at the table crying or something. Just like, oh God. And you're like, if only I could get in there. <laughs> oh, God. It wasn't really like a glowing door though. It was more of like, I guess that's the final destination. Okay. So it was actually like a... You didn't see it as like, a, if only I could get in there. It was like, oh my God, that's all I have to look forward to right now. Exactly. Okay. I guess I was yeah. taking it the other way. Like they've, it like. That's, I, that's nice that you saw that in a positive light. <laughs> I did. That says something about you. More of the show after this break. I know you post on Tapas and probably Webtoon and. You know, you said Reddit and Twitter and Facebook. Where do you like see the most feedback? I have a different relationship with every single platform. As great as social media has been for me and any other artists out there, I also absolutely abhor it and despise it for what it's done to comic strips. Uh, What it does is it creates like these bubbles. Social media wants... Their users obviously stay on their own platform, right? Right. You know, Facebook does not want any of their users to go anywhere else Mm -hmm. at any... Stay here. I'm locking the door. Yeah. Okay? I'll bring you food later. (laughs) That's what Facebook wants. So when I post stuff on there, it's just for the Facebook people, right? They get their enjoyment out of it, and then they can move on to the next thing in their timeline. Twitter, same deal, blah, 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 which sucks and kind of forces you to work in their world. I kind of rate it from nicest to to meanest. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Number one platform is my own site and Tapas. Uh, Tapas has been very nice. But as far as like social media, Facebook somehow has the nicest people. Hmm. I don't know if it's because Facebook filters it for me or... Is hiding me from the, the the bad people. People are just so friendly on there. I rarely get uh, criticism, which can be a bad thing. And then Twitter, surprisingly, is as much heat Twitter gets. They're pretty nice on there too. Really? Okay. I'll say of all the social media platforms, Twitter's my favorite because if I like if I like somebody on on Twitter, if they're bigger than me, or if they're just some little guy starting out, I can. I can retweet them and it can just make that thing explode and someone can do that to one of my comics, which I think is amazing. And then it starts to kind of like, they get the middle area of like Tumblr and Instagram where I don't know, those sites were like really not built for us originally. And we just kind of <laughs> moved in. People are really nice in there too, but I was so I was always turned off by Instagram for the longest time because it was all on the phone. Yeah. It was all on the phone. And I felt like Instagram was more for like p- photography people. Yeah. And not really my stupid comic strips on there. Uh, but <laughs> what forced my hand besides Instagram just becoming super popular was there was a guy or gal on there who – Pretty much was pretending to be me on Instagram. Oh, yeah. So there's, right now there's two uh, Mr. Lovenstein Instagram. There's mine, which doesn't have a dot after Mr. And then there's another one that does. And that person got there first and just grew this huge following on there just by posting my comics. Uh And everybody thought it was me. Everybody did. And did they pretend to be you? I don't know. It seems like all that he he or she did was just post my comics and nothing else. Never responded or didn't make it. Okay. Who knows? I mean, they could have been doing, they could have been sliding into some DMs. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Hopefully not. For a long time, I was like, okay, this is weird, but kind of uh, doing my work for me. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of flattering. It's one of those where it's like, that's really cool. And at the same time, is it, is this bad? It was just weird. Mm-hmm. It was just weird. And like, 
knowing that deep down that I had no control over it and at any moment this person could just post something super racist or sexist. Right. Yeah. Uh, and there was nothing I could do. I was convinced by like other artists to be like, you should, you should probably do something. Uh-huh. Like, All right. So I had two options. It was either like somehow get control of that guy's account, which seemed very hard or just make my own and try to catch up, which is what I did, uh, which was a wild ride. And people being like, are you the real guy or are you the fake guy? And I'm like, I don't know. Have you ever looked into getting a verified account? Oh, I tried. And oh, you did. Instagram just was like double middle fingers. Like, yeah. no, buddy. I was like sending photos of like my driver's license. You know, like I, was, really? I felt like I'd lost my identity. I got the weirdest relationship with Reddit. So many of my uh, readers came from there. I get so much exposure on there. It's a great platform because it's nice and neutral. Doesn't matter how big or small you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can you can make it big. But the commenters on there, Jesus Christ, just, they will say it. They will, yeah. Just, they will call you the worst things you couldn't have even thought of. It's just funny to me how angry people can get about a silly comic strip. Yeah, you know, it's just like I'm trying to picture someone reading the newspaper and they just read Hagar the Horrible and are just like, <laughs> I don't believe this. This is so bad. Oh, I'm going to find this guy and I'm going to tell him how much he fucking sucks. Yeah. Those guys didn't have to worry about that, but it's just, it's, it's, it's hilarious how much rage can be conjured because uh, they didn't think your, your uh, comic was funny. That is the difference with web comics too. Web comics are, they ride that line. They ride the line of like super supportive community and everybody going, you're doing great and your drawing's improving. And, you know, especially yeah. if you're starting out. And then the other side of people going, this isn't funny. You're not funny. This sucks. You know, like I've experienced both of those things more on the positive side. And that does exist. And it's weird. There aren't many other art forms that you would put online that do that. Actually, I don't know if there are. I guess I've never experienced it. I I don't know. I feel like nowadays, maybe that's the case for all. Yeah. You you do like a painting and there's this one guy who's like, fuck this painting. Fuck (laughs) you. I you don't know how to flip over a table. A lilac bush to save your life. It's supposed to be mauve, not red. <laughs> Lame. <laughs> like, this is so cliche. You know, I'm be, I feel like I almost like a crybaby when I, when I complain about it too. Cause it's just like, at the end of the day, it's just an online comment. And it's like, I, you know, I think about like people who perform live stand up comedians, mm-hmm. musicians. I can cry all day about, this mean comment, but I'll never have to get really face to face with someone who hates my guts or throws a beer bottle at me. It's one of those things where it's like you could have so many people following you, thousands of people following you, and then one person says something, and that's the one thing you hear. And that's yes. it's one of the things I really want to try and get over. And I want to be one of those guys that go, ah, I don't even hear those anymore. You do. It's true. Two things will happen if you post long enough. One thing is you just, you get a thick skin. Mm -hmm. You just like, you realize that those people need you to react to them or they're just shouting into the abyss. It's, you realize just how small they're being and you can just move on. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you learn to appreciate your audience for, you know, for how kind and wonderful and supportive they are. And you don't take it for granted. Like you said, you know, for every 100 people who, shower you in praise it just takes the one jerk to just wash it all away Mm -hmm. and that's the thing that sticks in your head for the rest of the day yeah i hate that i mean it happens to all of us with everything i mean (laughs) it's true any field you could be working an office job and you're having a great day and then someone comments on the way you tied your tie and then you're like sitting at your desk like oh god bill over in accounting is being a jerk How did you come up with the name Mr. Levenstein? Or Steen, if I'm being formal. I take either pronunciation. Well, here, you know, the funny thing about naming anything, like a, a comic strip or a band, your comedy troupe, at some point you have to stick with it. And you start when you're young, and then you just keep going. 
and you're kind of trapped. My relationship with my comic name is like the same I have with my first email address. I was just going to make that comment. <laughs> you know, it's like I was 12. I was trying to be cool. And uh, <laughs> now uh, when I have to like send out a formal uh, email to someone like, yep, yeah, and this is the thing you send it to. The, th the thing that I was obsessed with when I, when I wanted to name it was, wouldn't it be funny if I gave it an actual name like it was its own entity? It was its own person. It wasn't a character in the comic. It was the thing itself. Oh. Yeah, it, you know, it's kind of like bands that are like, like Pink Floyd, and it's like, well, who's, who's Pink Floyd? It's the name of the band. Yeah. I, with that in mind, at the time, I had been doing web design. I actually was a web manager for a time. And so I was pretty used to like building sites and getting the URLs and stuff. And I knew if I didn't pick a weird URL, it would cost an arm and a leg to get it. So I was like, well, if I make something really stupid, well, it will be really cheap. So those two things, it's got to be a name of the comic and it's like a person and it's got to be really weird. So the URL is cheap. This is a terrible way to <laughs> go about this. <laughs> so the, my first idea was, so I was 20 years old at the time. I'm driving around. I see the street sign that's that says Lovewood. And I laughed <laughs> to myself because I'm immature. Yeah. I still am. And I was like, that's a funny name. Uh, what if I had a comic called Dr. Lovewood? I go, I look it up. Oh, someone already has that URL. Really? Okay. Oh, wow. Nope, not going to even try because I want that URL. Uh, so now I was like, oh, what about Mr. Lovewood? It's like, look it up. Nope, taken as well. Damn. Wow. I Now I'm, for some reason, dead set on this, this name, Mr. Lovewood. And one day I just happened to be, I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to come up with ideas and I like I am reading the Wikipedia page for Frankenstein, the book. It's kind of like I'm creating something, and there's Doctor Frankenstein, and then there's Frankenstein's monster. And for some reason, I decided, well, I could combine love and love with Frankenstein and get Lovenstein. Just kept the Mister on there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. At that point, it just stuck. It's like there's no way, there's no way. And I check, I'm in the clear. MrLovenstein.com. <laughs> No one's got it, baby. I'm in the clear. Yeah. And I was so pleased with myself that I finally got this this name. I loved how stupid and goofy it sounded. You know, hindsight's 2020, and I think back to it now, I'm like, oh. okay, why did you pick this name? There's, there's a mister in there, so that's weird. And you put like a dot after mister, which could mess up my URL. It's hard to spell, Lovenstein. It's a long name. It's going to get mispronounced all the time. I'd go back and change it now, but I'm just momentum has decided that that's the name. But it also is with. one of the things that made it unique and makes it stick out. You it's know, true. first time I saw it, I was like, well, what the hell is this? It's it, it, curiosity. It still has that. It, yeah. does, it still has that curiosity to it, that weirdness. There's nothing else like it. Yeah, that's that's the terrible tale of uh, Mr. Lovenstein's monster one of the things you did that's actually kind of genius actually kind of true is the how to make a web comic part one video that you did i love that, that a while ago now it was and you were very young but at the same time you're talking like this is what you think of to do it you're really just kind of randomly saying things and the best part is at the end you go ah but i'm just kidding you and it's like i'll show you how i actually do the comics in part two and then you never made a part two <laughs> 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 I had the dumbest obsession with making a part one of something and then never making a part two. I don't know what was wrong with me at that time, but I did that so many times. I thought that was kind of genius. One of the other things that he does besides the comic is he created a game called Snollygoster. How did you get started doing that? Snollygoster. I just, the the name's the thing has to be really hard to spell mm -hmm. and be really weird. I you guess. were like, this worked once before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that one is like a, such a weird side project for me. Okay, so weird thing about web comics, you spend like less than half your time actually creating comics, and then the other half is either camping out on social media 
or worrying about being your own like merchandiser and marketer. I don't think Jim Davis was terribly worried about selling t-shirts and prints and stuff, toys and stuff like that. So, you know, I think Paws Inc. took care of that. We have to spend a lot of time worrying and thinking about creating merchandise. Like what looks good on a t-shirt? And for some reason, what ended up happening, I, I'm, I'm going to blame this on uh, The Oatmeal by Matthew Inman. Mm-hmm. He did The Exploding Kittens. I'm sure there was people before him, but he was like that first like comic artist that had like this crossover into doing a card game. And then for some reason it was like, well, I guess we all have to make a card game now. <laughs> and I actually did not want to do it. The way I got into this, my father... He saw the Exploding Kittens Kickstarter and how well it did. He's a tinkerer and loves getting into projects and stuff. And he's like, I could do that. I could make my own successful card game. My father, who's never made a card game or any kind of game in his life, but he he truly believed it. And he, so he starts dicking around with this. And then he starts like, being like, Hey, look at this. Uh, You want to, you know, maybe uh, work with me on this. It'd be fun, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to work on a card game. I don't know how to make games. And just over, like, the course of a year, he just, like, wore me down. And we just he just kept bringing it up. And he'd be like, well, we'll just pl- uh, practice with me. I just need someone to test this with. I'd play it, and I, can't, I couldn't stop myself with the gears. It's like, turn, where I was like, well, maybe if you did this, the game would be better. And then two next two hours are us going like, well, okay, we can't have that happen because then the player would be too powerful. And that's what, pretty much what led to us making a game was just my dad roping me in and then my brother got involved at some point. So it just became this family affair. It became predetermined that I was going to do all the art. Mm-hmm. <laughs> of course, yeah. I told myself, all right, if I'm going to make a card game as someone who does not know how to make a card game, it's going to at least be something that I would like to play. I'm a big fan of games that have hidden roles and you have to lie a little bit and bluff and all those kind of things. Like, I don't know if you've ever played those party games like Werewolf or Mafia. That's how I want this game to be. As long as I like this game, I'll do it. And then over the course of like two years, we slowly put this thing together. And I will tell you, Making a game is one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life. I would imagine, yeah. I already knew it was hard, and I still underestimated it. All the facets that go into it, just the artwork, working in the physical medium, which is very hard, knowing that this thing is going to fit nicely on a on a card, making rules, making it fun, figuring out how you're going to market this thing. Uh, it's a lot easier to market a book because my comics are in there. Hey, you read my comics online? Would you like to read in the book? This with a card game is like, hey, you read my comics online? Would you like to play a card game that has nothing to do with my comics? <laughs> uh, it just very slowly came to be, and I reluctantly became a part of it. Learned how to do so many things. Yeah, I would like bet. Form an LLC and a business and wow. figure out how to do global distribution. Like all the boring shit that you don't want to have to worry about. But it's good to know. Uh, it's just like getting insurance. Eventually you realize like, ah, yeah, I should probably have this. <laughs> <laughs> I probably will fall. It was a wild ride. Well, it's probably it's still the most challenging thing I've ever done. Hmm. The Kickstarter was such a colossal effort. I made like an animated video that I voiced over myself for the Kickstarter and did all the promotional stuff for it it was a success i'm we were very lucky i'm very thankful for everyone who supported that thing i was so happy with like how it turned out we still didn't nail the landing i mean writing the rules you try you have to predict every single interpretation and how other humans will conceive of your rules and i'll never forget like when when people started getting the game or playing it i was like getting messages on facebook and twitter like Okay, so we were playing your game, and Mm -hmm. this situation came up, and who's right, me or this other person? And so I'm, like, helping people iron out the rules. That's kind of cool, though. I mean, that, like, helps you improve it. I didn't mind it. Yeah. But it's just, it's like, I just, like, I'm trying to picture, like, someone contacting 
the people who made like I don't know Monopoly. Like, okay, we're playing Monopoly, yeah, and uh, <laughs> someone landed on Boardwalk, but <laughs> yeah, no, but that that goes right against what we were saying before because how cool is that that you created this Kickstarter game and then people are contacting you actually playing it? Like, it's not just the yes, we met our goal. Like, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really know, nice. Don't want to take that for granted that someone is spending their night, yeah, having a fun time kicking back some drinks with their friends, huh. playing your game. And it's, it's, it's one of the best things about creating anything. It's, you know, it's one of the reasons why I do what I do. It's because just knowing that there's somebody somewhere who's having a slightly better day because I, I put something out there for them to enjoy. If you'd like to learn more about J.L. Westover, you can visit his website at mrlovenstein.com. And if you're hearing this podcast for the first time, you can subscribe to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music for this episode is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, at lorenzosmusic.com. I'll be back next week with another episode, so until then, so long. So long.